The road to Jerusalem is beautiful, but an ugly structure cuts across the ancient hills. Depending on who you ask, it's a wall, or a fence, or a barrier. And depending on where you stand, it's either a necessary eyesore that protects the Jewish state, or it's a separation wall built to enforce an unequal system that allows one side to flourish while the other stagnates. A wall is either built to protect or to separate. Israelis call it a security necessity. Palestinians call it the apartheid wall. So which version is true? Why did Israel build this wall? For as long as I've been living in Israel, this thing has been here, winding across 434 miles of highly contested land. Most of it looks like this, an electronic chain link fence flanked by barbed wire and ditches, separating Israelis and Palestinians. But a fraction looks like this, 30 foot concrete slabs encircling big population centers like Jerusalem and Bethlehem. For the younger generation, the wall is a fact of life, just another feature of their home. Now, Ayub Ali is 35, he was a kid when the wall was built. Ah, uh, it's tough, man. Like, to live here, like, my generation, we grew up in the second intifada. So I was a teenager in 2000 when the second intifada started. I was just 13 years old. So I never dropped from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, like what my dad used to do. It's one of my dream now. But for the first 15 years of his life, the wall didn't exist. And that's because it's a relatively new addition to an ancient landscape. Maybe you've heard about the Arab-Israeli peace process, a nice phrase for the long, torturous negotiations that will supposedly end this conflict once and for all. In the 1990s, it seemed that these negotiations were actually getting somewhere. The Israeli Prime Minister and PLO Chairman were shaking hands on the White House lawn, signing agreements that were meant to lead to autonomy and security for both sides. We who have fought against you, the Palestinians, we say to you today, in a loud and a clear voice, enough of blood and tears, enough. But that never happened. In fact, things got worse. Today, this barrier is a visual reminder of the bitter divide between Israelis and Palestinians. How did it all go so wrong? How could peace talks end in this? Plenty of people on both sides supported the peace talks, but others did not. Some Palestinians viewed peace talks as a betrayal. Accepting a two-state solution meant accepting that Israel was here to stay, that the homes they left behind in 1948 or 67 were truly gone. Meanwhile, Muslims consider the land of Israel to be sacred Muslim land, and holy lands can't just be given away without serious discussion amongst religious authorities. But the government signing peace agreements weren't religious authorities. And so, many Muslims rejected their authority to sign away any piece of the land. Ironically, many Israelis felt the exact same way. The peace agreements and the eventual two-state solution hinged on Israel giving up control of most of the West Bank. But that land had been part of the Jewish story for thousands of years. The prophet Joshua had conquered Jericho three millennia ago. Why shouldn't Jews get to live there? This is the land of our ancestors. Politicians shouldn't get to sign that away so easily. As Rabin and Arafat forged ahead, extremists did their best to tank the agreements. On the Palestinian side, Hamas and Islamic Jihad sent a clear message to the Palestinian leadership. We will never accept your so-called peace process. Their preferred medium? Suicide bombs. But their victims weren't Palestinian. They were Israeli. Meanwhile, Israel convulsed in protest. As the death toll mounted, some Israelis compared Rabin to a Nazi, claiming his hands dripped with Jewish blood. They chanted. In November 1995, a Jewish extremist made good on that threat. He lurked outside a peace rally where the Prime Minister had just finished singing Shir La Shalom, a song for peace. And then he shot him three times. Rabin died en route to the hospital. The death toll kept growing. Over the next five years, another 300 Israelis were murdered in terror attacks. And by the year 2000, the peace process was dead too. For the next five years, the region burned. Over 1,000 Israelis and 5,000 Palestinians were killed. Palestinian suicide bombers targeted Israeli civilians while they were boarding buses or eating lunch or shopping at the market. Meanwhile, the IDF clashed with terrorist organizations and Palestinian protesters. Their targets were terrorist leaders. 
but civilians died in the crossfire while reporting on protests or participating in them. This is a story about geopolitics, not psychology, but trauma can play a pretty significant role in political decisions. And unfortunately, there's plenty of trauma to go around in the Middle East. March of 2002 was a particularly traumatic month. 12 suicide bombings killed over 100 Israelis, but it was the eighth of these bombings that scarred Israel for life. Hundreds of guests, including Holocaust survivors, gathered for a communal Passover Seder in the Park Hotel. But there would be no celebrating that night. A Hamas suicide bomber disguised as a woman sneaked past security and entered the dining room with a suitcase full of explosives, killing 30 and wounding 140 more. Some of the worst pogroms of Jewish history had taken place over Passover. But this was the Jewish state in the 21st century. It was inconceivable, unacceptable, that Jews were still being murdered as they celebrated their holidays in their historic homeland. The Israeli government had to do something. Two days later, Sharon announced Operation Defensive Shield and the idea of cracked down on terror cells in the West Bank. For nearly a month, Palestinians lived under strict curfew. Even Yasser Arafat was trapped in his compound. But the operation came with a heavy price. 30 Israeli soldiers and nearly 500 Palestinians were killed during the fighting. Meanwhile, the Israeli government drew up plans for a so-called barrier wall whose purpose was to keep terrorists from infiltrating Israel. This barrier wasn't a new idea. In fact, before his assassination, Rabin had established a commission to look into the prospect of building a fence between Israelis and Palestinians. And this might surprise people, but in the 90s, it was the left that floated the idea of a fence. Because you see, a fence implies borders, a demarcation between two separate territories, and it was the left that pursued a two-state solution. The left had advocated for cooperating with the PA to define borders, but Sharon's government wasn't interested in that. After all, over 100 Israelis had been murdered in a single month. The defense minister insisted the fence was not political and not a border, but a temporary barrier for security purposes. More than two decades later, the structure is still here, and its critics argue that it can't be anything but political. So did it work? Are Israelis safer? No one argues with the stats. Between 2000 and 2006, terrorists from the West Bank carried out over 3,000 attacks within the Green Line, killing over 1,600 people. Over the next 15 years, that number fell by over 95%. But numbers don't tell the whole story. And unsurprisingly, everyone's got a different interpretation of the stats. In 2006, an Islamic Jihad leader admitted on TV that the separation fence is an obstacle to the resistance. And if it were not there, the situation would be entirely different. But security experts point out that the barrier is just one element of Israel's increased security, including the guy who built it. Dani Tirza is the barrier's chief architect, and he emphasizes that everything about Israel's security situation is complicated. It's impossible to point to any single factor as the reason for the reduction in terror. As he says, you can't just build a physical infrastructure without the necessary security activity around it needed to maintain it. In other words, the barrier doesn't work on its own. True security requires monitoring, actionable military intelligence, and even cooperation with the other side. Which is exactly what happened in 2005. After Arafat's death, the PA's new leader agreed to cooperate with Israel on security matters. And that might have had something to do with the reduction in terror as well. But critics of the wall dismiss this argument. They claim that security is merely a pretext because the barrier isn't finished. In some places, it just stops. In other sections, huge gaps allow thousands of Palestinians to stream into Israel illegally every day, often in view of soldiers and cameras. So if the wall is about security, why would Israel allow these gaps? Well, it depends on who you ask. For Palestinians, the barrier is a land grab, meant to reduce the size of a future Palestinian state. The International Court of Justice agrees, stating that the barrier was unlawful, designed to aid in the annexation of Jewish communities in the West Bank. Annexation, land grab, what does that mean? Let's break it down. The modern state of Israel has been around since 1948. Originally, the UN voted that it should look like this. But after a long and bloody war with most of its neighbors, it came out looking like this. 19 years later, it fought another war. And over the course of six days, Israel gained this and this and this and this and this, which made things really complicated. Because post 67, the Jewish state controlled the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. Over a million Palestinians watched in horror and shock as Israelis streamed into land they considered theirs. Meanwhile, Israelis relished the chance to finally visit the holy sites that they had been banned from for 19 years. The Western Wall, the Cave of the Patriarchs, Rachel's Tomb, sites that symbolized the Jewish people's ancient connection to their land. Everybody, 
The West Bank is the name that the Jordanians gave the area, but lots of Israelis refer to the West Bank by its biblical name, Judea and Samaria, emphasizing the Jewish link to the sacred ground. A Barilan University archaeological survey has just found a small but incredible discovery. Two coins that date back some 2,000 years discovered in the Benjamin region of the West Bank. Israelis began establishing communities and land they considered theirs by right, helped along by generous incentives from the government. Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria see themselves as natives returning after a long exile. But most Palestinians point to their own generational link to the land. They ask why these Jewish Johnny-come-latelys should have the right to build communities in disputed territory. Nearly 500,000 Jews live in the West Bank, and the number is growing, which brings us back to the barrier. See, most of the barrier runs along the pre-67 boundaries that the international community accepts. But in some places, it bulges outward to include large Jewish communities within the West Bank. Israeli courts have blocked a few of these expanded routes, because the more Jews live in the West Bank, the less likely it is that they'll ever, you know, leave. And that makes it complicated for Palestinians to claim that territory as part of their future state. Because as far as the Palestinian president is concerned, not a single Israeli would be allowed to live in a Palestinian state. For most, it's a zero-sum game. Any Israeli gain is a Palestinian loss. Any Palestinian gain is an Israeli loss. And that's the mentality that has led some Jewish community leaders to insist that the barrier remain unfinished. Because once the barrier is finished, there's nowhere for their communities to grow. But the barrier doesn't present the same problems for Jewish communities as it does for Palestinians. The barrier cuts Palestinian communities and families off from each other. Communities separated by the wall have even begun developing distinct accents, as though they live in different countries rather than just a few miles away. Farmers who used to stroll out to their olive groves now have to apply for a permit to work their land on the other side of the barrier. But don't take it from me, take it from them. First of all, we cannot reach the Jerusalem. Although Bethlehem near Jerusalem, we can near Jerusalem, but now we need more time just to go around the separation wall to reach uh, Jerusalem. And uh, of course, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which, has, which is very uh, important in our religion. The barrier turns a previously smooth commute into an arduous journey across checkpoints. The road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem only takes like half an hour, but because of the checkpoints, the walls, uh, it takes me in two hours a day. In short, Palestinians within the West Bank have limited freedom of movement. They feel effectively trapped behind a barrier, a constant visible reminder that none of the promises of the past 75 years have panned out for them. They envisioned a defeated Israel and a sovereign Palestinian state, but none of that has happened. The frustration is mutual, because Israelis are still dying in terror attacks. 19 Israelis were killed in terror attacks over six weeks in 2022. March of that year, the IDF started reinforcing holes in the barrier, replacing old fencing with 30-foot concrete walls. Sometimes, it seems a solution is farther away than ever. But some are more optimistic than others. Rabbi Yehuda Cohen has been living in the West Bank for over 20 years, where he works with Jews and Palestinians to build a more just society. And though he doesn't have all the answers, he does have something that's just as important, hope. We do have to make peace with the Palestinians. And I would say that as daunting as that might sound, as, as hard as that might sound, I don't think Jewish-Palestinian peace is any less possible than reviving a dead language uh, back to life uh, and in gathering a broken and scattered people from the four corners of the earth back to the country we had been displaced from 2000 years earlier, or even fighting the British Empire to free our land. I think all of those all of those objectives were probably a lot more difficult than the challenges we have in front of us today. So if we could do that, we could do this. Even within Israel, there's debate over the wall. Has it solved problems or created them? Has it made Israelis safer or just made Palestinians' lives harder? Depends on where you're standing. But one thing is certain, the wall is a symbol, a visual reminder of our divisions and our competing visions for the future of the land we share.